Welcome everyone, my name is Jeremy Jewett. I am the Public Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy here in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, and on behalf of the U.S. Embassy team, the Rwanda Bar Association, and everyone that we've brought together for this event, thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited to uh, present this great two-part training series on Amicus Curi in the hopes that uh, members of the Rwanda Bar Association and advocates here in Rwanda uh, are better positioned to use this new and novel tool to advocate uh, for uh, their clients, for interests in Rwanda and help expand the rule of law discussions in Rwanda. Uh, by way of introduction, I am a member of the state of Wisconsin bar, the cards right here. I am hoping that they will accept my CLE uh, application for this program. Uh, however, I am not a practicing attorney. I have been a U.S. diplomat for the past 11 years, and now here in Rwanda have been working on a variety of educational and cultural programs in the public diplomacy sphere that help uh, bring our uh, perspectives and conversations to a variety of audiences in Rwanda. We are delighted to be uh, coordinating today's program with the Rwanda Bar Association. Thank you so much uh, to my counterpart at RBA, Liberal Madjambare, for all of his this program happen. Uh, and we'll be very happy to welcome the chairman in just a few minutes for some welcoming remarks. We are delighted to have a great set of three speakers uh, over the course of this week and next week. Um, as part of the United States' public diplomacy programming, we've got a great uh, speakers program that oftentimes brings speakers in person uh, to countries overseas to engage in this type of programming. In uh, this day and age, uh, unfortunately, that is uh, often virtual. Uh, but by benefit of that, we are very lucky to have Dwayne Sam with us today, uh, a very experienced uh, attorney in the Washington, D.C. area who brings a variety of uh, clinical experiences uh, under his belt as well. We also have two fantastic uh, local speakers uh, for this week and next week. We are uh, very excited to have Moise Undabarashi and Florida Kabasinga with us uh, to present today and tomorrow. Thank you so much for your willingness uh, and leadership in this field. Uh, before we get too far, I would like to establish just a couple ground rules. Uh, please note that we are recording this program. We are uh, excited to be able to make that recording available to members of the Bar Association um, and other practitioners here in Rwanda after the program uh, for those that may, may be interested in uh, learning more about the content of this program or for a refresher that anyone uh, may need that. But please do know that we will be recording and posting this program. We, throughout the program, have built in question, answer, and discussion opportunities. Uh, we'll be able to do that uh, both based off of uh, questions left in the chat box here. Uh, also, we'll have the opportunity for people to come off mute and ask any questions or uh, pose any questions to the speakers. Um, Aside from that, though, please do try to remember uh, to stay on mute so that we can uh, make sure to hear everyone. Uh, feel free to have your camera on or off at your discretion. Aside from that, it is a pleasure uh, first to introduce the chairman of the Rwanda Board, uh, Rwanda Bar Association, Julian Kavarunganda for a welcome for today's program. Mr. Chairman, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to meet you, to meet you, and thanks for organizing this event uh, together with the Bar Association. And I'm happy that uh, Florida and uh, Moise has been uh, uh, confirming that they will be co-chairing or co-participating with you. That is uh, 
allowing the Bar Association to be able to give his uh, insight and the way it is from working in Rwanda. So for me, just a few words of uh, one minute to say thank you to the US Embassy and thank you to your team within the US Embassy. And um, uh, I do think that for our members that uh, will be participating in this, in this training, it will be an opportunity to know how it, it is working in Rwanda, how it is working elsewhere, especially in US and by a fellow advocate. So thank you for your time and I hope your credit will be confirmed. If not, I can send a word to your president of the Bar Association or Law Society, if it can help. So uh, that, that is a, a word, a small word to say, let's, dis, uh, let's stop uh, discussing uh, about just uh, a speech and now a debate. So we can debate, we can share experience and knowledge. And that is the reason why we are, we are meeting here uh, online with the COVID. And next time, maybe next year, it will be physical meetings or whatever COVID will allow. But let's begin by this e-meeting, e-conference, and uh, learn from each other. Thank you very much. That was my words. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that warm welcome. And second, I would like to introduce one of my colleagues at the U.S. Embassy, our political officer, Ryan Castleberry, who has uh, been instrumental in helping our team organize this training series uh, to share a little bit word, a few words about uh, the embassy interests in uh, rule of law and democracy and governance uh, from his portfolio and his perspective. Ryan, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, thank you to our colleagues at the Rwanda Bar Association and for uh, all of our friends also from CSO organizations that I know are joining us today. Um, I'll, I'll be very brief just to say, uh, well, first of all, uh, I don't have a, a card uh, showing that I'm a member of any bar association, so I still have to work on that one. But, uh, but no, this is a really a great opportunity for us to uh, have an exchange to talk about our shared interests and how not just the legal profession, but also uh, all of the resources and, and the people who we have in our societies can contribute to the fairness of the judicial proceedings in our countries. Um, as a diplomat, one of the things that, that I feel very acutely is that uh, every time I have to move and do a new job, I have to relearn a whole bunch of uh, different kinds of issues. And I know that in the increasingly complex and globalized world that we're in, there's uh, similar issues for judges who have to deal with all kinds of cases covering uh, a host of issues uh, where the background on these issues are incredibly complicated and, and changing by the day. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us to talk about uh, what does it look like for us to uh, think about how amicus curiae briefs can provide input into that process so that we're all doing everything we can, uh, both as professionals, uh, whether legal professionals, legal experts, uh, or citizens uh, to contribute to the processes uh, in our courts. So um, very, very happy to be here. Um, and thank you so much to, to everyone for taking the time to participate in this important exchange. Uh, appreciate it very much. Over to you, Jeremy. Thanks so much, Ryan. Appreciate that. I will... Uh make a point to drop my email address in the chat box too. Uh, perhaps Ryan um, and my colleague Claudine will be able to do the same, but do feel free to reach out to us over the course of the program or afterwards if there are opportunities for collaboration uh, with you, with your firm, with your organizations uh, going forward. Uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to chat more and entertain those. Without uh, further ado, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker and presenter tonight. Uh, Dwayne Sam is a, an attorney with uh, Womble Bond Dixon in Washington, DC. He has a variety of experiences representing clients in complex proceedings concerning communication law, constitutional issues, the interpretation and enforcement of federal statutes and administrative law. In addition to his legal practice, he serves as an adjunct professor at William & Mary Law School in Virginia, where he co-directs the Appellate and Supreme Court Clinic. We are very excited to have Dwayne joining us uh, both today and next week. Please help me welcome Dwayne. Welcome, Dwayne. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that warm welcome, Jeremy. I am happy to be here and to uh, present a brief primer on uh, amicus uh, curie uh, participation in the U.S. courts and uh, provide some uh, an overview as to how the system works uh, here in America. Um, it's uh, I'm happy to hear that it's a, a welcome uh, development in Rwanda and that it's something that's been added and I think it will help to uh, enrich uh, the legal system and legal legal process there. Um, but sort of wanted to begin by trying to answer what I can imagine for many of you is perhaps a burning question that inquiring minds want to know, which is how precisely this Latin phrase is pronounced. And I, I know that there, there's a lot of strenuous debate on this topic. Um, is it uh, amicus, amicus, um, amicus? Um, uh, rest assured, and, and perhaps most fittingly, um, the, the loyally answer is that it depends. Um, you know, if you look this word up in the dictionary, you'll uh, and, and you listen to the pronunciation online, you'll hear lots of different uh, pronunciations. The one I tend to to favor is uh, amicus or or amicus, um, but to each his own. Um, so, having established that, and and also, I, I guess the plural form of that word as well is also um, the, the matter of some controversy. Is it, is it uh, amicus or, I'm sorry, uh, amici or uh, amici? I tend uh, to, to favor uh, the, the former uh, pronunciation, um, but again, to, to each his own. So to, to begin, why don't we start with the origins of um, the amicus curiae brief and just talk a little bit about how it began, um, how it came to and has risen to, to primacy in the American legal system. So believe it or not, the uh, amicus curiae system dates back to Roman law. The original amicus was a bystander. That is someone who didn't really have an interest in the cause, but used his own knowledge to make a suggestion um, on a point of law or fact for the benefit of the presiding judge. So really just sort of a neutral party that um, wanted to, to aid the judge. And in fact, um, the, the Latin phrase amicus curiae um, is, is literally translated friend of the court. And so in this capacity, um, this neutral bystander um, sought to aid the court's understanding. Um, in pre-18th century England, uh, the amicus was a neutral lawyer that was physically present in the courtroom and would engage in an impromptu uh, oral shepherdizing of cases. Uh, so the, the shepherd uh, citation or, or reporter is used to sort of check the status of cases to see if they've been overruled, how they've been cited. And, uh, and so the, the amicus in 18th century England would, would shepherdize cases to apprise the court of the status of the case and to bring up cases not known to the judge. Um, an interesting factoid is that the original amicus in contrast to how it's used um, in contemporary legal society is that the amicus back then uh, was the lawyer and not the client. And so the amicus really stood um, in an essentially professional role and relation uh, to the court. Um, in, in, in contrast to today's common practice as well, it's interesting to note that organizations um, could not and did not serve as amicus uh, curiae. And what that meant is that you didn't really have those sort of third party interests um, being advocated for in the same manner that you see today. It was really and truly um, a, a function and a role that was meant to, to edify the court, to, to benefit the court and to, to aid the, the court's understanding. So, you know, many uh, commentators and, and uh, scholars have pointed out that in those halcyon days of yore, the, the word, um, you know, was really, again, used to describe that professional relationship between the judge and the lawyer. It really wasn't until the 1900s that courts began to attribute amicus briefs to organizations um, that sponsored it rather than the attorney who submitted it. Now, once the amicus 
uh, brief practice arrived in America, the adversarial system certainly took hold and it became common for amicus curiae to represent the interests of third parties. The first American uh, amicus to make a formal appearance at the US Supreme Court, and I should add that this presentation, although uh, amicus curiae, uh, curiae briefs are, uh, you know, it, it's common, not just in the federal court system and in the state court system as well. This presentation will focus primarily on the federal court system and primarily on uh, amicus participation in the Supreme Court, only because that court really, I think, serves as a bellwether and sort of a low star for how the uh, amicus practice has developed and evolved throughout the years. And also, I think, signals um, just where the practice is is headed in the future. So the, the first American amicus to make a formal appearance at the U.S. Supreme Court was the famed orator Henry Clay in an 1821 case involving a Kentucky land dispute. And so Clay's role in the case was unique at the time uh, because he served both as an arm of the court, which is the traditional role of the amicus, and also as an advocate for the non-party landowners. Um, since Clay, since that decision 200 years ago, the judicial system has experienced what I sort of view as a veritable torrent of amicus participation. And we'll talk about this and unpack this some more in a few minutes, um, but I think it's, it's been noteworthy, um, just the volume of amicus briefs um, that, that have been filed um, in the intervening period. Um, throughout the 19th century, it has become increasingly common for third party interests to advocate, for third parties that are interested um, to advocate uh, for their concerns uh, in the form of an amicus brief. Some scholars, many scholars believe that the amicus has, you know, has gained purchase in the United States primarily because of the limits the, on third party representation in our common law system. Um, and what the amicus brief has done is, is that it now effectively serves as a catch-all device for dealing with some of the difficulties presented by uh, the common law adversary system. Beginning in the 20th century, however, um, there was a paradigm shift um, in the way amicus briefs were used. As, as one scholar frames it, it the, the, the amicus brief has moved from sort of a neutral friendship um, to really sort of positive advocacy, and some might even say partisanship uh, b before the courts, right? Whereas before the idea and the goal was to perhaps edify the court and to assist the, the presiding judge in understanding the case, now amicus briefs primarily um, have taken on a, a different tenor and which is to provide advocacy for third parties. Indeed, it, it's not uncommon to hear uh, 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 Amici often referred to as lobbyist and many interest groups are, are actually established at least in part for the purpose of of, of participating in appellate cases. Um, today, the general practice in the United States, uh, particularly in the Supreme Court, is to allow essentially unlimited amicus participation. Uh, Rule 37 of the Supreme Court rules formally requires individuals and organizations wishing to file amicus briefs to obtain consent from the parties. Uh, the federal government and the states, however, are exempted from this, accepted from this requirement. Uh, so that's that's one sort of distinguishing factor there in terms of how amicus briefs function in, in practice. Um, the overwhelming majority of, of amicus uh, briefs, however, are filed under so-called blanket consent, um, meaning that uh, leave to file an amicus brief is granted as a matter of course. And what that has done is, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, it's really resulted in a deluge of amicus uh, briefs and practice at the Supreme Court. But before we get into the actual numbers, I do think it's important to note uh, how the nature of uh, the amicus brief has evolved over the years. And I wanna begin by sort of highlighting what has become uh, 
known as sort of the quintessential amicus brief, which is the, the Brandeis brief. Um, in, in, uh, 20th, in, in the 20th century, we saw the genesis of this brief. And the Brandeis brief was a, a pioneering legal brief that was the first in the United States, uh, first in United States legal history to rely more on a compilation of scientific information and social science, <clears throat> excuse me, than purely on legal citations. And so the, the brief is eponymously named after the famed legal advocate and later justice, uh, Louis Brandeis, who in a 1908 case called Muller v. Oregon filed an amicus brief. In that case, the plaintiffs in that case uh, challenged a state law restricting the number of hours women were allowed to work. And uh, Brandeis filed a brief in support of the law and he adopted what at the time was a remarkably revolutionary strategy. His brief contained just two pages of legal argument and a whopping 102 pages of evidence about how women needed special protection from the hazards of long work hours. The brief was remarkable and influential, not only because it had never before been done in the United States, but according to some scholars, because it really sort of upended um, and, and turned on its head the prevailing orthodoxy at the time uh, in, in the 1800s, which really uh, uh, largely regarded uh, 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 logic as as the prevailing um, tool to, to, to be used in legal briefs. Um, as one scholar noted, um, this understanding of law as a logical undertaking really renders claims of generalized fact largely irrelevant. So prior to that time, prior to um, uh, the Brandeis brief, you really didn't see a, a sort of overt marshalling of of facts and non-legal argument um, to buttress one's case, but that's precisely what the Brandeis brief did. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, what happened is that legal realists really began to challenge the, the prevailing orthodoxy and began to understand, and it really challenged the understanding rather that, uh, that the law um, was really developed by uh, really developed through, through a factual uh, uh, give and take, so to speak, and that it would really inure to uh, a litigant's benefit to present to the court all of the relevant facts, um, legal and non-legal, that might bear on the court's um, uh, interpretation of a particular statute, of, of a constitutional provision, or whatever the law is um, that, that was in dispute at the time. And so because individuals began to view courts really as sort of lawmaking bodies. Um, they thought it would be beneficial to provide that, that body of, of factual information to the court to help them sort of suss, suss out um, what the issues are and, and what's really important. At bottom, there is no denying that the Brandeis brief has had a substantial impact on legal thought and has really marked a sea change, I would say, for the court by introducing the use of vivid factual details as a way to sort of break away from the formalism that previously dominated the legal analysis. A few well-known examples uh, come to mind from the modern era, and those include uh, psychological studies, on the impact of segregation in uh, the well-known case of Brown v. Board of Education. Also, uh, medical evidence about abortions in Roe v. Wade. And social science <clears throat> that, excuse me, about affirmative action in uh, Greta v. Bollinger, uh, just to name a few. Um, but there's no doubt that the, uh, the type of factual detail uh, that is being marshaled um, in cases has really represented a paradigm shift uh, in courts. So what exactly, let's talk a little bit more about the types of facts that uh, amicus curiae are supplying the court with in their amicus briefs. Um, in the quintessential uh, Brandeis brief, uh, the facts provided are so-called 
uh, legislative facts. And it was the legal scholar, Kenneth Culp Davis, that really first defined a legislative fact in, a 19, in 1945. And he defined it as a fact that informs a court's legislative judgment on questions of law and policy. In other words, it's a legislative fact that, you know, a good way to think about it is a, a generalized claim about the state of the world uh, that's used to aid in the law interpreting and law making functions of the appellate court. So a few examples might be, um, a few examples of questions rather that may be answered by legislative facts include, uh, does corporate money corrupt uh, politics, right? Um, not a legal question, but a factual uh, question that can be answered with factual analysis. Uh, do violent video games increase the likelihood of children engaging in violent behavior? Uh, what are the health benefits of marijuana use on the human body? And when does an adolescent's brain fully mature? These and other questions have been answered and been brought to bear in, in various uh, legal cases uh, across the country. And it, is, it has been the role of the amicus curiae brief to sort of fill the gap and to aid the court's knowledge to provide additional context and perspective in assisting the justices in arriving at the correct, uh, at the correct solution, at the correct answer, the correct decision. So I wanted to turn now just to amicus curiae by the numbers to, I think to fully appreciate the ascendancy and really now the primacy of amicus briefs, it's helpful to look at the numbers and to understand just how much and, and how much they've grown throughout the years and just what a large role um, they play in, in contemporary uh, American jurisprudence. So over the past 10 terms, for example, um, amici uh, have cumulatively filed more than 8,000 briefs and they have participated in 96% of all argued cases and were cited by the justices in more than half of their rulings. Now, to put these numbers in perspective, a key study has shown uh, that from 1946 to 1955, Amiki cumulatively filed just 531 briefs. Uh, that's an average of fewer than one brief per case. And from 1986 to 1995, that number increased to about five briefs per case. In seven of the past uh, 10 Supreme Court terms, a single case has generated more than 80 amicus briefs. By contrast, uh, seminal cases of the past that I've mentioned before, like Roe v. Wade uh, uh, or uh, uh, Brown v. Uh, Board of Education produced just 23 briefs and six briefs uh, respectively, 23 and six uh, amicus briefs that is uh, respectively. So you can see that there's been a, a huge sort of a groundswell of amicus participation over the course of the last several years um, in terms of the numbers. Amicus participation has also broadened as well um, uh, since 2010. Uh, so for example, amici have participated in 96% of all argued cases um, you know, uh, by contrast, between 1946 and 1955, uh, Amiki uh, Curie uh, filed briefs in only 23% of argued cases. And from 1986 uh, to 1995, only 85% of argued cases had uh, Amicus uh, Curie support. And what's notable about these numbers is that the totals recounted do not include amicus briefs that were filed at the certiorari stage, right? So even before the, there, there are amicus, uh, there's amicus participation even before the court, the Supreme Court uh, grants cert on a case and decides to hear the case on, on the merits. So turning now to the most recent Supreme Court uh, term, this past Supreme Court term, uh, October term, uh, uh, or, or one of the most recent Supreme Court terms, uh, 2019 to 2020, that term had more than 900 uh, amicus briefs, 911 uh, to be precise, and it's the highest average uh, number of uh, briefs uh, per case in the modern era since, since amicus briefing has become 
uh, uh, prevalence in American jurisprudence. And, and that number of 9-11 really trails only um, uh, the number of briefs that were filed in the 2012-2013 term, which saw over a thousand amicus briefs filed. Um, in the 2019-2020 term, uh, amicus briefs were filed on average, filed an average, I'm sorry, of 16 briefs per case at the marriage stage, right? So in addition to the actual marriage briefing that the court is reading, they're also wading through, on average, more than a dozen briefs from interested parties that are offering a variety of different perspectives and, and bringing factual nuance uh, to cases um, for, for the edification of the judges. And so I guess the question then it, that, that's raised is to what, it to what extent do the amicus briefs actually affect um, and, and impact the, the justices' uh, decisions? Well, the justices cited briefs in 65% of cases, um, which is another record um, from the 2019-2020 term. Um, and they relied on these briefs for a variety of legal issues uh, ranging from uh, government policies to history, uh, religion, medicine, psychology, even uh, financial uh, implications of the court's decisions. Um, the rate tops the previous nine terms, the, the rate from 20, uh, 2019, 2020 uh, tops the rate from the previous nine terms during which the justices cited friend of the court briefs only in an average of 46 to 63 percent of the cases. In uh, 2019 and 2020, there were eight different cases um, in which there were at least 30 amicus briefs, in which at least 30 amicus briefs were filed. And so you can see that um, a lot of this, you know, the, the amicus brief has really sort of risen to to, to a state of prominence um, in the Supreme Court, particularly with very sort of uh, controversial or hot button cases that are sort of front and center in the public spotlight. They generate a lot of attention um, and a lot of participation from, from the bar, from the appellate bar. Um, in particular, the Bostock v. Uh, Clayton County case, which held that uh, Title VII's ban on sex discrimination uh, protects LGBT employees, that topped the list in 2019-2020. Um, and, and that had, I believe, over, uh, over 80 um, briefs uh, that, that were filed uh, in that case. Um, I'm sorry, 94 um, unique amicus filings in that case. And the judges have cited, um, uh, cited about 10% um, of the non-government, historically, the judges have cited about 10% of non-government amicus briefs filed in cases with signed opinions. But that citation rate of what is known as green briefs, they're called green briefs because uh, it's the color of, the, it's the, color of their, uh, the, the, the brief cover for, for amicus uh, briefs in the Supreme Court. Um, uh, the citation rate of those green briefs um, is in line with prior terms where the justices have cited between five and 12% of non-government briefs. As for government briefs, um, which are authored by the, offices, the Office of the uh, Solicitor General, um, those amicus briefs, the justices cited about 63% of the briefs submitted by that office, um, which is again, roughly in the middle of the pack, you know, compared to prior terms, which, you know, typically sees between 44% and 81% um, uh, citation uh, rates in prior terms. The bottom line is clear that amicus briefing um, is, is very active in American jurisprudence. Um, the justices rely on it to a great deal. It is cited quite frequently. And um, it, the, the, the volume of briefs only uh, tend to rise the, the, uh, depending on the importance and uh, the significance of the case uh, before the court. So who exactly are the parties that are authoring the briefs and what, uh, what specific insights might that, uh, might that have or implications might that have for how amicus briefs uh, may be used um, in Rwanda? Well, in the United States, um, it, it appears that 
the entities um, that tend to offer the most amicus briefs uh, and, and that gain the most traction, um, I'm going in order of, of significance here, uh, would certainly be the office of the Solicitor General. Uh, the justices will often cite amicus briefs filed by the SG's office because the SG's office sort of has uh, institutional credibility with the higher court. Um, and they're sort of regarded as, uh, as, as the eyes and the ears for the court to apprise them of, of the, the factual issues um, that, that the court needs to, to take note of. Um, in October term 2019, the government's briefs earned attention across the court lineup with seven of the nine justices citing uh, an amicus brief uh, during the 2019-2020 uh, term. And it's note noteworthy that you know, the fact that the briefs were cited doesn't necessarily mean that the justices always agreed with the SG's office. Sometimes those briefs were cited to expressly disagree with them, um, but the fact still remains that the briefs were cited and that they garnered the attention of the justices. So the, the, the justices, the law clerks, certainly laid eyeballs on the briefs. Excuse me. Another entity or, or another group that, that also seems to have gained traction in front of the Supreme Court when it comes to amicus briefs thing um, would be the states, right? The justices uh, have similarly relied on state amicus briefs um, in majority and dissenting opinions before the court um, uh, to, to help inform uh, its, its, uh, its decision making. Um, another uh, group uh, that often has traction and purchase before the Supreme Court would be scholars, legal scholars, academics. Um, studies have shown that briefs by academics get closer attention, at least initially. Um, in, uh, in, in the 2019-2020 uh, term, every single justice cited at least one brief by a professor um, in at least one of their opinions. And again, you know, it, it's noteworthy here again that, you know, the briefs were cited, the fact that the briefs were cited is, is not, does not necessarily imply that the justices agreed with the positions espoused in the briefs, but it does, again, underscore that these briefs are, um, are gaining uh, uh, the, the, the court's attention and that the arguments there um, um, have some purchase with the justices. And last but not least are appellate uh, advocates and amici with established uh, appellate practices. Uh, studies have shown and experience suggests that advocates and amici known for quality briefs also garner more attention from the court. This certainly held true in the 2019-2020 term Overall, about around 40% of the amicus briefs that were filed um, and cited by justices were authored by law firms with specialized Supreme Court practices. And so that sort of just provides a sort of a brief introduction as to sort of the provenance of amicus briefs, how they sort of uh, changed and uh, uh, changed not, not just in the volume of amicus briefs, but also changed in how they, they were being used over the course of the last 200 years. And then also just some, intro, you know, some introduction in terms of which, from which institutions the, the court tends to place uh, the most uh, significance and tends to rely on the most um, when those amicus briefs are filed. And that may you know, be a harbinger or, or signal um, you know, how courts in Rwanda may also apply and rely and, and use amicus briefs as that system uh, gets off the ground. So at this point, I'm happy to, to answer any uh, uh, follow-up questions or questions in general uh, about the process. Thank you so much, Dwayne. We did have a question in the chat from Florida. Uh, Florida, would you mind uh, taking yourself off mute, introducing yourself and your practice, and asking your question? Uh, 
Florida may have stepped away or not be able to come off uh, mute at the moment. I'll oh, ask her okay. questions. Oh, perfect. Hi, Florida. Hi. So um, he, he can't see the question, or you want me to ask it anyway? Yes. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself briefly and asking your question? Oh. Um, hi, um, Duane. Uh, my name is Florida Kawasinga. I'm a lawyer in Rwanda. Um, I, um, my question, I, I may have missed it uh, when you made your presentation, but uh, from my understanding of what you have presented, um, in, in the US, um, um, Amici briefs are only filed before the Supreme Court, or can you do that in, in, a, in a lower court or in a, a state court as well? No, it's a great question. Uh, Thanks for asking it, Florida. Uh, amici briefs are filed, amici briefs are filed in state and federal courts. Um, uh, state appellate courts, uh, state uh, less often um, in, in state trial courts, um, but it, there, it's, it's not the unique uh, you know, province of the Supreme Court. It's just that in terms of the volume and how uh, they have historically been used and in terms of um, how they've evolved, the Supreme Court has certainly sort of served as a proving ground, so to speak, for that, um, and it's been instrumental in their development. Thank you. Thanks so much for the question, Florida. Also uh, in the chat, we have Andrews from the Legal Aid Forum, who serves as the executive director there. Uh, Andrews, would you be able to uh, join us to share a little bit uh, about you, your practice, uh, and some of the uh, experience and research that Legal Aid Forum has uh, on the subject matter? Jeremy, you are hijacking me because I posted something. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't ready to do that, though. So, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, if you if if guys here can be able to download and read this is something we did almost 10 years ago so in, in the framework of legal aid and the framework of standing which is always very important in in court so we did three assessments one was on amicus curia another one was on local standing and then another one was on public interest litigation so we are looking at the legal framework in Rwanda, if they favor some of those mechanisms as an organization that is interested in advancing human rights. So, very specifically on Amicus Curie application in Rwanda, I, I mean, I have, have, not, have not gone back to read because I know some laws have changed. We found out that uh, there were some, there were not express provisions allowing that back then. I should say back then because I have colleagues from our Rwanda Bar Association, I know the penal code has changed, law and evidence has changed, and we are looking at, at other laws, procedural laws, to see whether uh, the principle uh, uh, is really um, admissible. And uh, there was some, some um, evidence that uh, amicus query can be applied in Rwanda. Absolutely. So if you're able to read that paper, you'll be able to find that. But as far as I recall then, I haven't gone back to see, there's no express provision that allows um, for amicus curiae, except uh, that um, people can be, I mean, courts, officials can call anyone to give uh, information on a case, and then they are obliged to do that. And if they don't, uh, they can be punished. I remember Article 232 of the Penal Court then. But I believe that has changed because of late what we have seen. We have seen the Supreme Court so citing amicus uh, from uh, the University of Rwanda. I think Moise is here. So we've seen this practice now coming, uh, which I think I've seen them will be speaking. But um, uh, as far as I know, it wasn't very clear. It might have changed. I have to go back and check. I'm a lawyer, but as you said, Jeremy, uh, I, I practice it so because I'm the executive director of the Legal Aid Forum, although we deal with the legal staff. So that's it, but um, it's an interesting subject matter to look at, but I know of let our court have been admitting uh, friends of the court to come and speak to the court on important issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. And that will be a great link to our, the next part of our discussion, which will be uh, Moise guiding us through 
some of those policy and procedures uh, mm. that have been put in place recently. Thank you. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, I want to introduce himself and ask his question. He has some great questions in the chat here. Uh, some of these will go to part two of the conversation with Dwayne next week, where he provides uh, some, uh, some guidance on best practices that he's seen, that others have seen in terms of uh, good strategy and how to best use uh, amicus briefs as advocacy tools. But John, would you uh, mind introducing yourself and your practice uh, in your two questions here? Yeah, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity uh, and, and organizing this interesting discussion. Uh, definitely, uh, work, I'm called John Dachikwa. I work for the Center for Rule of Law Rwanda. Uh, it's a national organization uh, interested in, um, of course, access to justice, strengthening the rule of law in Rwanda, and specifically, um, uh, recently, we are very, very much interested in uh, Amicus. Um, we have uh, we are working on a case right now, um, an Amicus brief in relation to a very very long-standing case on expropriation in one of the Kigali suburbs. And uh, yeah, so uh, we are very much interested in the subject matter. Uh, in terms of the questions I just flagged out here quickly, uh, one of them, uh, this is of course, I'd like to hear from what uh, uh, Mr. Dwight uh, has to say. Uh, the whole issue of interest in a case and neutrality, I find these two aspects uh, somehow challenging to, I mean, the thin line uh, between um, you know, having an interest in a case, as he has just mentioned, that. Uh, Recently in the US, there's a lot of interest for people submitting amicus who have interest in certain areas, but also uh, the fact that you have to remain neutral. I think I would like to hear from uh, our presenter what has to say on that. And secondly is that uh, when I heard from him on institutions which have most recently gained traction in terms of filing amicus, I never had anything to do with public interest organizations like NGO, civil society organizations. I would just like to hear from him why, and uh, you know, just his comment on that. Thank you. Sure, two very good questions. To clarify, um, it's not that the uh, that the amicus curia needs to remain neutral. The justices, the judges, certainly need to remain neutral. Um, but I think what I was chronicling earlier was the idea that the amicus has evolved from being sort of a neutral bystander to an active advocate that um, that is pitching a very specific view to the court um, on behalf of a third party. That's that's where that's how amicus usage has has changed and evolved over the years. And, and so that line is 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 no longer being straddled, quite quite frankly. Um, it, it's now decidedly in the camp of advocacy. Um, often partisan advocacy uh, before appellate courts, and you know parties that engage in amicus briefing are doing so at the behest um, and on behalf of parties that want to put a very specific view before the court. As to your second question regarding um, public interest institutions, you're absolutely correct that public interest institutions. I didn't mean to suggest otherwise that that they don't uh, factor prominently in amicus curiae practice, I sort of lumped them under the, under the umbrella of um, other advocates and amici, but they also factor prominently public interest organizations um, on both sides of the, the, the political spectrum over here in the United States um, factor prominently. Uh, many of them exist, as I mentioned in the presentation, for the express purpose of participating in appellate matters uh, before appellate bodies. Um, it's also the case too, I mean, I mean there are a host of, of, um, of other uh, sort of public interest bodies. Um, in legal clinics is, is certainly one um, that has um, grown in ascendancy as well. Many law schools across the country, including the one um, uh, that, that I co-directed at the moment at William & Mary Law School, 
have appellate clinics um, that provide appellate advocacy, um, both on the merits and also in an amicus capacity um, for various uh, public interest uh, organizations. Um, uh, you also have, I think it's also the case too with sort of the, um, uh, and other scholars have pointed this out too, with the sort of advent of the internet and the uh, democratization of knowledge and information, um, it's much easier now um, to have and, and to marshal facts and, and, and information um, for the court's benefit and, and really for your client's benefit um, to advocate before the court, whereas before a lot of that stuff um, was not nearly as accessible. So yes, to answer your question, one, um, there is no, the line is no longer being straddled. It's very much um, an advocate's role, um, uh, sometimes a partisan role that is being played um, by the amicus curiae and two public interest organizations certainly factor prominently in the amicus landscape. Thank you so much. Uh, for those questions, John, uh, and for furthering our uh, conversation there. We'll take one last uh, look at the chat box to see if there are any questions for this portion uh, of Dwayne's presentation. Um, one question I might uh, ask Dwayne off the top is, you know, Rwandans take a lot of pride in homegrown solutions to, uh, to things and having uh, some of their own policies and procedures and, uh, and preferences, whether it's in the legal sector or outside of that. Are you aware, aware of any kind of differences in the United States, whether it's at the state level or federal level in terms of different, um, you know, is there amount of, uh, of discretion for courts in terms of the rules and the policies and procedures that they're setting up for amicus briefs that might affect how either courts uh, receive and consider amicus briefs or how uh, civil society organizations or, uh, or other interest groups might be approaching that amicus brief process? Sure, no, it's a good question. And it does get touch a little bit on the presentation for next week, but I, I think it'll um, per, perhaps um, you know serve as a as a good maybe cliffhanger and, and you know uh, bait for for folks to attend uh, next week. But in the Supreme Court, for example, and this is true also of the federal courts of appeals, um, there is a rule that states that um, amicus briefs that do not add to that aren't additive that that don't provide information uh, beyond what's already being provided in uh, the briefs on, on the merits by merits council are disfavored. Um, it's interesting that the court uses that word. They don't expressly disallow them, um, but they say that those briefs are disfavored. And so the prevailing view, I think, when crafting the amicus brief is, you know, you, you mentioned sort of a homegrown solution and and, and taking pride in that. Over here, the, the idea is that the amicus brief should um, offer something more, provide some additional context, um, something that the court isn't otherwise um, going to get from the merits brief. And, and so having sort of a me too brief that merely reiterates, you know, a point that, um, that merits council has raised is not um, particularly um, helpful uh, from the court's perspective. And there have been, you know, as you can imagine, with the torrent of griefs that, um, that courts have been receiving, many courts have sort of come out um, in, in various opinions to sort of decry uh, the, the usage and volume of amicus briefs um, that don't provide um, you know, something additive to the court that, that aren't useful in that particular way. Sounds great. Thank you so much for that cliffhanger. We are indeed looking forward to seeing where that conversation picks up next week as we transition from uh, this great overview of amicus curiae in American and international jurisprudence 
and some of the contemporary US trends uh, to next our discussion uh, with Moise Undabarashi on uh, some of the Rwanda specific policies, uh, preferences, uh, and uh, procedures to next week's discussion that will incorporate both US and Rwandan best practices in creating compelling, impactful amicus briefs uh, that are likely to uh, be successful in what you or your organization or your clients are looking to achieve in litigation here in Rwanda. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Looking forward to, uh, to that next week. Thank you so much for bringing uh, your expertise and your perspective to our discussion today. We certainly appreciate that. Next, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, Mois Undabarashi is a uh, partner in the Litigation and Dispute Resolution Department at Trust Law Chambers here in Kigali and brings a diverse range of experience in a variety of uh, legal courts here in Rwanda. Moise, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you so much for sharing your expertise uh, and your experience uh, with the members of the Bar Association tonight. Over to you, Moise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I think I won't take too long in my introduction since you've done it. Uh, briefly, um, I will start with a, a simple way of making this term that looks uh, too much Latin, like the way my, my, my the first speaker did. But in, a, in simple terms, amicus curia is a Latin term that means friends of courts. Uh, and this can be um, uh, either a physical person or an organization uh, that um, chooses to submit its brief to court so that uh, uh, they can influence a court decision in which they might have interest or uh, might be of a general interest. So this is briefly what, uh, what, uh, what it is in terms of uh, definition. Uh, and uh, as uh, Andrew uh, Wright put it, in Rwanda, we do not have this uh, uh, term or concept in a specific way uh, provided in a, in, a, in a statute, I would call a statute or a law, a specific law. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, might be, might be uh, in, in one way or the other uh, a challenge in terms of how this is applied in our courts because of the tradition and, uh, and uh, like how our judicial system evolved. We came from a background whereby uh, in the Romano Germanic system whereby uh, we, we tend to like find everything in codes and in the statutes or in the laws gazetted and uh, available to the public so that they can be used in one way or the other. However, uh, as Jeremy put it, this is uh, uh, another a, a way of like uh, finding our homegrown solutions in our in our in our in our system, uh, whereby I would say that this concept is allowed and used in our courts of law by a creation of the Supreme Court precedents. We we've seen a number of. Uh, Amicus Curia briefs being filed in Supreme Court recently in uh, constitutional challenges. We've seen it uh, like being developed in uh, in 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 all forms of uh, uh, all forms of uh, litigations that are filed to the Supreme Court, seeking uh, to 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 come up with a number of decisions. For instance, uh, I would say like uh, in case number RA spec uh, 0002 slash 15 slash Supreme Court, that's when the, the Supreme Court 
noticed this the fact that there was no there was no law that provides for this uh, amicus curia uh, amicus curia concept in our laws but then the court held that it's an advantage to allow a person or an, an organization with specific skills or knowledge which are helpful to the court to reach a well-founded decision to participate in a litigation as amicus curia. This is a decision by the court, by the Supreme Court. That means uh, since then, then the concept was introduced in our, in, our, in, our, in our legal system as per this decision of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Supreme Court. But then the question then becomes, uh, if this was the decision of the court, how then is it done? Uh, how do people who want to submit their briefs as amicus curia come up with, uh, with their brief? How is it submitted to court? How is it uh, accepted by the court? You know, all these are questions that then follows the admission of such a concept that does not have specific guidelines to like uh, of how they should be submitted. So uh, in terms of procedure, um, anyone who wants to be part of a litigation that he, he or she is not uh, uh, someone to submits the request at the registry of, of the court. This might be the registry of the Supreme Court or any court that, is, that, that he wants to be part of, uh, of, of a litigation that is ongoing. Then uh, it's up to the court in its discretion to accept a, either an individual or an organization as to be, to be amicus curia, depending on the kind of expertise that they might have shown in their, in their, in their, in their, in their, in their submissions to the court so that the court understands that they might be going to have something new and uh, to see that this person or this organization is something that is going to add value in terms of what they are bringing to court. So that's, uh, that's and then when the court agrees that an organization or an individual will come to court, then they are requested to submit their brief within a timeline that is provided by the court. Then after, that's when the court requests these parties that are supposed that have submitted their their brief to come to court and make oral submissions in the litigation that i attended in the supreme court uh, the amicus that joined that litigation that i will mention as i progress in my presentation uh, these amicus were represented by lawyers so they were they were they were they were uh, representative of some organizations, but they also got represented by lawyers who also assisted them in making both in writing the briefs, but also in making the uh, the the, um, the 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 oral presentation and submissions in court. Uh, so um, I would. Like, for instance, make uh, an example. Uh, I wanted to provide to give an example of a case in which we uh, we 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 participated. Um, here, I'm getting into like, for instance, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court benchmark and point of references that might help the 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 view the 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 people who are attending to understand how it worked and. Uh, how the court ended up like agreeing with this uh, amicus curia to participate in the in a, in the court case. So one of the one of the examples that I picked out of many that are publicly available on the website of the Supreme Court is the case that was filed by one of my partners called Richard Mugisha. He petitioned the Supreme Court uh, seeking to like nullify a number of provisions that were published in the official gazette on, in the law governing 
offenses and penalties in general. Then uh, after we've uh, filed the, 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 the petition uh, by way of uh, constitutional challenge, because this is one of the forms that is allowed in our laws. I will get to this uh, as I, I go forward in my presentation. Uh, then the, 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 the court made an announcement that of calling people who wanted to participate as, uh, as, uh, as uh, amicus curia to like send in their requests before and then later the court allowed uh, I would say three of them to be part of the of the litigation while submitting their their briefs. Briefly, uh, what happened in this this in, in, in like the ones that were allowed in this uh, in this uh, in this litigation was the School of Law of the University of Rwanda. It was uh, an non-governmental organization called uh, uh, Profam Twese Hamne. This is an NGO that promotes women's uh, rights. And there was also the association, the Rwanda Association of Journalists. So in the assessment of the court, these are the three that we are, we are, we are, we are presenting something that would add value in terms of what uh, the court wanted and the, the court case that they had at hand. This is a case that is publicly available on the website of the Supreme Court. I think uh, for whoever would want to have uh, uh, a look at, uh, at the details, uh, it can be found uh, easily. Another case um, is a case that was filed by um, a fellow or a, uh, a guy called Murangwa. Uh, this was uh, to do with the, 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 the tax law on, on properties which was recently uh, enacted by, by, by the government of Rwanda and, uh, and then immediately after its publication, uh, Murangwa went to Supreme Court to seek that some of the provisions can be, can be nullified since he thought it was, it was contrary to the constitution and uh, especially in its article 15 and 16 and 34. So he wanted the court to, to, to like, uh, struck out some, some provisions because they were not in conformity with the constitution. Again, in this court process, the court allowed Amicus Curia uh, to be part of uh, this litigation. And um, the School of Law came back of the University of Rwanda as uh, one of the organizations that were allowed. But also uh, there, there was also Transparency International which took place and submitted its brief. Uh, and uh, one thing that was also very crucial and important in this litigation was that even individuals, lawyers, individual lawyers were allowed to come and submit their pleadings and their brief to the Supreme Court so that they can be considered and, uh, and, uh, and uh, influence the decision of the Supreme Court in as far as this uh, petition was concerned. So this was also another new development. Um, the last case that uh, I wanted to discuss is the case um, that was decided by the, by the Court of Appeal. This is uh, something that uh, I wanted to, 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 to give a, a diversified uh, number of cases that shows clearly that this is not only in Supreme Court, but even in the Court of Appeal, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's the case um, that the prosecution was bringing to court uh, versus a certain Sengyumva and others. It had to, it had to do with, um, with uh, the killing of elephants and uh, selling of uh, the parts of the elephant, especially the ivories. So um, in this case, uh, the issue at hand was uh, had to do with the determination on whether someone that, that is selling these parts like the ivory would have necessarily participated in the killing of the of the of the of the of the elephants then uh, rdb was called in do, into this um, into this litigation as an amicus 
uh, with the purpose of uh, of uh, of uh, providing its expertise in as far as conservation is concerned, so that the court can understand clearly that someone might even have gotten this ivory and not necessarily have for have after having killed the elephant. Um, Another issue was the fact that someone that was selling uh, this, uh, this uh, ivory did, was it's something that was not clearly provided for in our penal code. But later, uh, the, when RDB joined the litigation, uh, it showed clearly the court that there was the East African Community Customs Management Act that was to be applied uh, and and uh, not get this this guy go away without being punished uh, for having uh, trading this uh, this ivory illegally across the region. Eventually, this influenced the decision of the court because the court ended up uh, taking a decision based on this uh, East African Community Customs Management Act, which was not considered previously by the High Court, uh, which shows clearly how uh, this kind of um, this kind of uh, amicus can influence in pro or against a decision uh, like, like uh, it can influence in one way or the other a decision to be taken by the court. Uh, another uh, thing that I wanted to mention is the fact that uh, this, this, this amicus courier uh, in Rwanda can apply in a number of litigation in a variety of litigation that, that happens across the country in a number of courts. Uh, but specifically, I've uh, taken like uh, three parts of the litigation that might be of, of interest for, for, the, for the participants to, to like understand that this is allowed and uh, whoever would want to join a litigation in terms of like, for instance, constitutional challenge. He would be he he or she would be allowed whether it's an individual or an organization. Uh, of course, he we or she we have to respect the, the 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 above mentioned conditions, and the court is the one to decide whether it can allow someone to be part of the litigation or not. It can also be applied in public interest litigation, uh, as well as in uh, in uh, in an authentic interpretation litigation that might be filed by the Rwanda Bar Association, especially or the cabinet, which are the two organizations under the constitution of Rwanda uh, allowed to like uh, take this kind of authentic interpretation to the Supreme Court, which is the court that has jurisdiction. Uh, so, um, in as far as constitutional challenges concerned, the, the, like the process and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, how the bench is formed, how they they came up with the, they came up with the decisions provided for in Article 72 of the law uh, determining the jurisdiction of courts. Uh, this is this is a law that was gazetted in 2018, uh, and uh, it, it it provides like the procedure and the and the conditions under which someone can 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 file a petition to the Supreme Court. Number one, uh, uh, this is whoever wants to, to submit this kind of uh, petition, he or she should be an, an, an individual or an organization that has specific interests or has any specific interest in the, in the, in the, in the matter that, that is brought to, to the court. Specifically, I would encourage the participant to read the, the, the the judgment uh, filed by Richard Mugisha in the court, because the Supreme Court elaborated very much on this interest, on this part that has to do with interest. Uh, for lawyers specifically, they were given this, this uh, uh, kind of privilege, I would say, to submit any kind, given their profession, uh, like the, 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 the kind of obligations that they have professionally uh, to promote rule of law and so on, they were given the opportunity to be considered like to be the interest can be linked with the, with the, with their profession as uh, as lawyers in terms of wanting to to, to promote and 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 um, make progress in in terms of the rule of law 
Another thing, another condition, if I try to go very quick because of time is not on our, in our, on our side, the applicant must annex the, 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 the law uh, that he, he is uh, like uh, uh, challenging or of, in, in the dispute. And um, uh, the government uh, lawyer has to be present to that hearing. That's also another, another thing. The bench of the judges has to be, is going to be like five, five judges. And uh, lastly, in terms of uh, what is required for this constitutional challenge uh, is when the Supreme Court holds that uh, a certain, certain provisions are unconstitutional, it informs the parliament and then it's also published in the official gazette. So these are, this, this is the kind of process that, uh, that is used for constitutional challenge but in which is linked with our, with, our, with our topic in one way or the other, because it's a procedure in which amicus curia is, uh, is allowed. Another way of uh, getting into court to seek this kind of litigation uh, that the amicus would be allowed is the public interest litigation. Uh, this public interest litigation process is also provided under Article 80, of the law number 30 slash 2018, uh, determining the jurisdiction of courts. This is also another, another law that was gazetted on uh, June 2nd, 2018. It also allows a, a, like a physical person or a government, a, a government institution or a political organization, a company, a non governmental organization or an association with a legal personality to bring an action uh, to the court to seek uh, like a public interest to be to be to be protected or to be uh, to be decided upon by the Supreme Court in in a way that that organization or that individual might be wanting. In this in this in this same process, the applicant must demonstrate clearly the interest that he, he or she has in that very process that is being, uh, that is being, uh, that is bringing in court. Uh, the, 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 the way to introduce it, this is, uh, it's done by the usual way of uh, filing court cases in Rwanda, uh, which I think uh, is uh, not of our topic, but this, the, no, the normal ways through the integrated electronic case management, which we all use while filing court case in, cases in, uh, in courts. Um, the hearing is conducted in public. Uh, again, this is, uh, this is a, uh, a process that requires five judges uh, to be on the bench while uh, like adjudicating and uh, uh, making decision on these kind of cases. I would say that uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a, a, a process that uh, seems to be a bit complicated because of the kind of uh, study. One of the conditions that I did not mention may be in my, in my, uh, in my, in my pre uh, presentation of the conditions above is that there should be a report on, um, made by experts demonstrating the seriousness of the issue and its resolution uh, attempts in cooperation with the institution, uh, the government, or with the government institution. So there should be this kind of report, which is a prerequisite and a condition to allow someone to go to court that to show clearly that this is something that was never, was not resolved by uh, the organization that is in charge of, uh, of such, um, uh, such a, a issue. Uh, recently, we've had one case that was brought by the Association of um, Insurers. They petitioned the Supreme Court um, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, putting in place the minimum wage, which is one of the one of the one of the prerequisite and or the conditions that allows them to calculate the damages whenever someone, like for instance, had an accident and they are supposed to be paying. So they brought this petition to the Supreme Court uh, um, 
and uh, they were seeking that uh, the, the government of Rwanda can be ordered to put in place this kind of minimum wage. Uh, but uh, they were not, they did not fulfill the requirement and then uh, they are, their case was dismissed. Um, and uh, another another thing we saw was the fact that uh, this very specific case, there was no amicus, but uh, I thought it was very important that it's mentioned that this is something that has already been tested in our courts. Um, authentic interpretation is another form in which uh, people can, uh, can, can, can go to court to seek that uh, the Supreme Court can can clarify, like for instance, a confusion that is in the law, uh, or whenever there is a contradiction, two judgments that are contradictory, and then uh, the interpretation, when the interpretation was based on the same law, it might be submitted also to the Supreme Court so that they can, uh, the Supreme Court can make uh, an interpretation in that very specific, um, uh, in that very specific. Uh, provision and then provide an interpretation, a clear interpretation and how it should be understood. Uh, this, uh, this authentic interpretation was tried by the, also was tested in our courts. The Rwanda Bar Association uh, brought this um, uh, in case uh, number RAS spec 00001 in 2017 and um, uh, in the in, in this uh, in this judgment in this judgment by the Supreme Court, it was a very, it's a very important judgment that is also publicly available on the website of the Supreme Court. Uh, it provided guidelines in its paragraph twenty five, like guidelines shows uh, like what someone should be like an organization or someone that wants to to file for authentic interpretation should be fulfilling. These conditions is that uh, it's almost uh, like the same with the, with the above ones. The, the applicant must demonstrate interest. Uh, they are, when there are this kind of uh, contradictory judgment, like I said previously, there should be uh, this judgment and show that the legal provision was not interpreted in the same way in those two judgments. Um, the petition can also be received when the, the terms or the, 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 the provisions or the, the, or the clause causes confusion in terms of interpretation within one statute, one provision that has like two interpretation that varies. So, and uh, another thing that needs to be specific to be specific in the authentic interpretation is the fact that this is done through Rwanda Bar Association. If you look at uh, our constitution, you notice that whoever wants to apply for this kind of authentic interpretation, we do it through the Rwanda Bar Association, which has to analyze the, 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 the request and then after apply for that very person to the Supreme Court. In this judgment, again, uh, they, they, they had to interpret and um, Make uh, make it clear uh, in the in this very paragraph twenty five. Uh, so uh, briefly, um, as I conclude, because uh, uh, I think um, uh, I've tried to be brief in as much as I can, so that I cannot uh, like take too much time. And I see that there are some questions that I have to respond to. Um, this is uh, briefly the amicus career. Courier is a concept that is not uh, in our in our law and statutes, and, uh, and as I said, this is something that uh, that like having something gazetted and legislated in our laws is something very important in as far as our practice is concerned because of the traditions of where I come from. Uh, but then uh, the the judiciary of Rwanda has found its own way of accommodating uh, this kind of. Uh, and Korea, and it has really contributed in one way or the other in uh, providing uh, um, uh, justice that is really based on uh, a well-researched and, uh, and, uh, and profound expertise that someone might not might be having, but not necessarily being part of, uh, of, uh, of that very litigation. 
And, and I even think this is because of this development and this, this jurisprudential uh, uh, development, that's why uh, even after this research, there is a research that my colleague Andrew mentioned. Uh, yeah, I've seen it, but uh, you see, this is something that have been in place for now 10 years. Uh, but I think um, they, I really do agree with the recommendation that uh, the Legal Aid Forum provided at the time. Uh, given the, the importance of, uh, of how this amicus courier can contribute to, to, the, to the improvement of our, uh, our, our judgment rendering by the judiciary, I also find it very crucial that this needs to have a kind of guidelines by the Supreme Court or even have it gazetted or accommodated in the future in the future amendments of the law on procedure or on the law governing uh, evidence and its administration. Uh, but uh, I think uh, for the moment, the reason why maybe it might have not been uh, um, uh, a priority, it should be because there is this, uh, this uh, backup created by the Supreme Court uh, decision. Um, also, um, I did mention very much the, 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 the website of the Supreme Court that contains really a number of judgments that were rendered in terms of uh, uh, that admitted amicus courier and then uh, uh, ended up making some de important decision in, in constitutional challenge. Uh, so they are, it's, this is something that is publicly available. If you go to the judiciary, you go to the law reports, they are all reports, then you find a number of decisions that were rendered, which we cannot really exhaust uh, while discussing this topic uh, within 30 minutes. I think uh, that's, uh, that's what I'd uh, prepared and uh, I wanted to share with you. I think that's, that's it. I thank you. Thank you so much, Moise, for that great uh, overview of uh, Amicus Curiae jurisprudence and procedure in Rwanda. We appreciate the expertise that you bring to the conversation here. We've got some great questions. I'll admit I contributed some of them, uh, but let's go first to John's question. John, could you uh, take yourself off mute and uh, ask about your question on procedure and clarity for lower courts. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Moise, for uh, the great presentation. Uh, I ask this question, of course, because, um, as I said, uh, we are filing an amicus uh, with uh, uh, the Grand Instance Court in, in Yarugenge, TGI. And um, well, one thing I want to say is that uh, uh, maybe Moise never touched that, but uh, of recent we have seen uh, we have seen uh, uh, um, uh, amicus being filed at uh, TGI, and the recent case was about surrogacy, where we had uh, amicus being filed by the University of Rwanda School of Law, and we had HDI Health Development Initiative, and Haguruka Association. And um, uh, I think that was a very good, great uh, development by lowering uh, or accepting amicus even at lower courts. Uh, so based on that experience, we were very much interested to find another amicus, as I said, on expropriation, uh, a case going on, an uh, ongoing case about expropriation. So, uh, but we just realized um, the procedures are not very clear because when we, f we consulted um, the people at HDI, I, how they did it. Uh, it was basically uh, they contact the registry and the registry told them, okay, it's fine. You submit uh, your, your amicus and then we'll consider it. Okay, so they did it. Uh, with, they submitted the hard copy and that's all. And then it was, they were invited uh, to submit their oral presentation in court. Uh, but in our case, when we did that, so what we did, we wrote to the, uh, the president of the court, uh, Nyarugenge TGI, uh, requesting to submit uh, uh, Mikas. And we thought maybe it was going to be handled administratively uh, for him to respond to us, okay, you allowed, go and submit, uh, go now and file your submission. 
Uh, but after, you know, that took us a long time waiting for the response, written response. And just a few days ago, he said, OK, you know what? Uh, this is it's something we cannot respond administratively. So I have filed this, I've put this in the system, and the judges who are going to hear the case will review this and come and take a decision about if we allowed submit a MICAS or not. Uh, so we have, they said we have to wait on the day of the hearing, which is uh, the case is scheduled to take place on the 6th of May, so that we know the fate if we're allowed to submit or not. Uh, so that's why I was asking, like, um, I know maybe your experience, Moise, at the Supreme Court, maybe the procedures could be very clear, but at the lower case, uh, I, I, I'm asking you if you, your advice or your op opinion in terms of uh, the procedures, how people should file this and how it should be examined, you know, at the, the filing, the examination of if you're allowed and then the actual um, uh, oral uh, presentation during court. If they are, I would just like to know your take on, on, on the procedures at that level. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, I think uh, since this is something that is still in a, a, in a court case and the court has not yet made a ruling on the same, uh, I think this is, a, the, even in the previous judgment that I, that, I, that I mentioned at the Supreme Court, it was, it was filed within the register of the court. And then when the court came back uh, uh, in the next hearing, they had to like make a ruling on whether they are accepting the the, the, the amicus curia or not. So that means uh, I think uh, you guys at this point should wait. Uh, and uh, in that same hearing, I think the court will request you to go and, uh, and show clearly the kind of value that you want to add in the same process. And uh, uh, I think you, 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 you also have this judgment that were rendered by the Supreme Court, which I think should be part of your brief and should be uh, backing uh, uh, your brief to like allow you to, to be part of this, uh, uh, this litigation. In terms of pro procedure, I understand it might not be clear as I mentioned, uh, but, uh, but then there is this precedent, which is a creation that I think should serve as uh, an example uh, to allow you to, to like reach that litigation that you feel like you have interest in, uh, that you want to join uh, eagerly. And uh, that's why in my recommendation, in, uh, uh, I also said that there, it's, it's good that we have these guidelines mentioned there like uh, in, a, in a clear way, not only, not only to mention it as a, as a concept, but guidelines that shows clearly and the conditions that someone who wants to be amicus should be fulfilling. I think this is something that needs to be taken care of. And uh, as RBA, I think we, we, we can, uh, we can uh, proceed and uh, also make this recommendation to see that this can be clarified on each and every level uh, of, of, of the procedure. Yes, thank you. May I say something on that? Please do, jump in, Florida. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so the case that has just been mentioned by John is, um, a case that I actually um, filed um, in a lower court. Um, and then, um, um, of course, the, Ami, the Amiki that he mentioned um, applied to join. It is true that there are no formal um, guidelines or procedures for how to appear in, in any of the courts for um, as, as Amicus. However, um, this is a topic that we'll touch on on the next training, um, uh, which I'll talk about in best practices. But since John is in the middle of this, um, I thought I should briefly mention, um, mention what, has, um, what has transpired both at that lower level uh, and also at the Supreme Court. So before you actually are admitted as an amicus um, in the courts of Rwanda, you must um, file an application to, to appear in which you show, um, you demonstrate your neutrality and also demonstrate your um, your expertise on the topic and how you're going to help the court in, in its determination of the issue before the court. 
usually that is filed with the court registrar and they upload it in the system. They are not the ones who um, admit you. It, it, it is necessarily the court that will admit you after considering your expertise. But what we have learned, um, because I've appeared on several occasions um, on behalf of um, uh, uh, groups that have been admitted as um, amicus uh, before both the Supreme Court and other levels and the Court of Appeal and others, what we have discovered is that it's best to actually file that application along with a detailed brief of what you will be filing if you are admitted. That way, when the court is considering whether to admit you or not, they already have, have a well informed and detailed um, brief on what you will be submitting. So you, you put the court sort of in a fix of, this is what I'll bring to the table. So consider my application. Normally what happens is that um, like all other issues um, in Rwanda, um, in, in before courts of law, they will have a small hearing on, on the expertise uh, where they will um, sometimes convene briefly and then come back and, and admit you and then right away um, go into the main hearing or, or um, uh, let you know that you've not been admitted, which is something that I've not um, experienced so far. But John, if you have not filed a detailed brief, I'll file it. Um, you're likely to have a, a short hearing um, on, on admissibility of your organization uh, as a and its expertise and its admissibility as um, an amicus. So um, I would advise that you file a detailed brief such that uh, already that will be considered. I hope um, that um, um, explains a little bit more than uh, uh, what you already knew about these processes. Thank you very much, Florida, for that clarification indeed. Thank you, well appreciated. You're most welcome. Great perspective there. And that answered one of the questions uh, that had come to my mind as well. Moise, what have you seen in your experience? Do courts seem to have a relatively high bar in terms of what they're expecting to see before admitting someone uh, as amicus or is it a relatively low bar? Uh, what have you seen in your experience? Uh, well, uh, what I've seen in uh, like in the experience of the the litigation we brought to the Supreme Court was uh, uh, the, the the courts the courts expectation we always uh, like uh, decision we always uh, depend on uh, the kind of value that they see you're going to add because uh, uh, at the end of the day they do not want to to allow amicus. Uh, um, like a number of amicus that we come and submit briefs that are not really adding value and uh, this most of the time is assessed depending on uh, depending on uh, on the on the on the expertise or the experience that we might have in the field that is be of the case at hand so uh, I, I think that's 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 the way they 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 they, 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 they assess. But it's up to the court and the court discretion to come up with a with a with a with a with a with a decision that they agree or not. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ryan. Would you jump on to uh, introduce your question, and then we'll go next to Dennis. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so I, I was interested in the comment you made about the requirement uh, that the, there has to be a report from experts uh, effectively demonstrating the value of the of the uh, amicus brief. Uh, could you address a little bit um, who might those experts have to be and particularly do they have to be a government institution? Could it be a professional association? Could it be an independent expert? Um, how is that defined? Thank you. Um, in the previous litigation that we've had here in, in Rwanda, it was a variety of uh, organizations. It was not necessarily a government organization. Like for instance, in the in the in the in the last case that I did mention, only that's when a government organization like a Rwanda Development Board was called. In, uh, in, the, in, in the litigation to come and uh, clarify something that had to do with, uh, with, um, with, uh, with uh, conservation and elephants. But otherwise, there were personal, there were individuals, specifically lawyers, 
and uh, uh, otherwise it was uh, like uh, completely non-government organization like Transparency International, like the School of Law at the at the University of Rwanda. Uh, it was it's it's like um, it, it's completely different. It depends on uh, on uh, on uh, what uh, on on the kind of case that the court has uh, at hand. Maybe one thing that I, uh, uh, I wanted to, to, to emphasize was the fact that this part that I did present was uh, in as far as, um, uh, in as, far as uh, the, the litigation were mostly of constitutional matters and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, I think for in the interest of the viewers, it's also very crucial that they note that uh, they in, uh, in the new uh, enacted the law of uh, governing uh, the, the criminal procedure, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, this, uh, this new development that came very soon in 2019 when this law was enacted. Uh, so people might be or, uh, get interest in reading the Article 129, in as far as Amicus Curia is concerned. So, but this this is something that has to do with the criminal part of the the procedures that are in court, and uh, even uh, the case that I did mention was that I was referring to was of 2015, which means uh, people might be pick interest in reading this Article 129. Thanks. Thank you so much, Moise. Uh, next, we'll go to Dennis. Hi, Dennis. Would you uh, mind introducing some of your uh, comments and questions? Hello. Hi, welcome. I, 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 I don't have a question. I had a, yes. I, I only had the, a comment which uh, Moise has, uh, has touched. I was uh, only talking about Article 129 of the Law of Criminal Procedure, and he has mentioned it. Uh, so I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Very good. Thanks so much, Dennis. We will give a moment for any additional questions to come through on the chat, or if anyone would like to uh, raise their hand or take themselves off mute for a question here. Uh, one question, Moise, I was trying on the judiciary website to find where uh, these are located. Is there a specific link you had said there under reports? Um, let me, let me get on it and then give the reference when I'm on it. Sure. Um, so when you get to the, to the website of the judiciary of Rwanda, you, 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 you see a link to case law. Yes. So when you get you get to run the law report. Yes. Then uh, in the search box, if you write Amicus Korea, you get a number of decisions. They search all that in search all database. Then if you write Amicus Korea, you will browse like a number of decisions. There is a lot of decisions that were uh, where cover single Florida petition the Supreme Court. She's the most active uh, lawyer we have in the Rwanda Bar Association. Great, excellent. Thank you so much for that. So I think here, here they will find like a number of them uh, that, that can help whoever wants to file a petition. Yes, that would be great resources yeah. for those who'd be looking for good examples of amicus curiae brief that have uh, have met that level of uh, of interest and value to the court, um, and uh, likely were influential in the court's decision. A great resource for those looking at amicus curiae briefs for the first time. 
Well, absent any last minute questions, uh, I wanted to thank you, Moi, so much for joining us today and for adding your experience onto uh, Dwayne's inter introduction to the jurisprudence and recent trends of amicus curiae in the United States. We really hope that that is a good foundation for uh, Rwanda Bar Association members, for uh, civil society organizations, for public interest uh, advocacy organizations, for individuals, for advocates in Rwanda who are looking to help inform the, uh, the courts at any stage in the process uh, where they may have an interest uh, and value to add to the court uh, and to serve that critical role of friend of the court. Uh, on behalf of Ambassador Roman, who will be, uh, who is happy to join us uh, next week for our follow-up session at the same day, Wednesday and same time, from four to six uh, to give some conclusionary remarks. And everybody at the embassy, uh, we thank you for your participation today. Special thank you to the Rwanda Bar Association for uh, organizing, uh, bringing everyone together uh, and helping us connect with uh, Moise and Florida for uh, their expertise uh, and helping everyone here understand the policy and procedures for amicus curiae in Rwanda and best practices uh, at the US level, international level and Rwandan level in using those friend of the court briefs to uh, really advance some great uh, advocacy points on behalf of your clients or on behalf of uh, public interest organizations here in Rwanda. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I'm happy to stick around in case there's any uh, questions or feedback. If not, thank you again so much, Moise. We appreciate your perspective. Thank you to uh, Dwayne, and we're looking forward to next week's program as well. Uh, welcoming back Dwayne and uh, welcoming Florida and her perspective there. Thanks Thank so much, everyone. Have a great evening. All right.